as it did not act. There we are. Well, thank you, uh, Pamela, and uh, good morning, bonjour tout le monde. This is about 27 days in September of 1972, when this country, Canada, from coast to coast to coast, was transfixed with a hockey series. The 90% of the Canadian population was said to have watched the series either on television or listened to it on the radio. And conversely, in the Soviet Union, we estimated that 150 million Soviet citizens watched this hockey series. Eight games, four in Canada, four in the Soviet Union. You know, the uh, Soviets were tired of uh, TV broadcasts about brick production, concrete production, wheat production. They loved sports. And the sport that they loved the most was hockey. And the sport that Canadians loved the most is hockey. So you can already see where we're going here. The series resulted, it's turned out to be a legendary series. Uh, the team was called the Team of the Century. That's Team Canada 72, the Team of the 20th Century. The greatest moment in Canadian sports history was when Paul Henderson scored the winning goal in Game 8 in Moscow on September the 28th with 34 seconds left to go. We were the great heroes beginning this series. We lost in Canada. We became the underdog. We became the... Uh, you know, they became the Goliath and we pulled it out at the very last second. And it wasn't only sports, but it's about Canadian history itself. The Dominion Institute of Canada did a survey at the end of the 20th century. And they said that this hockey series was one of the top 10 historical events in Canadian history. So along with Vimy Ridge, Medicare, the flag, patriation of the constitution, D-Day and so on. So this is very storied, uh, a very storied series. It's deep in the heart of Canadians. And I happened to be in Moscow at the time. I had joined the, uh, the Department of External Affairs 1968 in May and was put on the Soviet desk right off the, the get-go. And lo and behold, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia in that summer. And I guess I did all right because they sent uh, myself and my wife to Russian language school. And if you've been on the language schools, they're here, there and everywhere. But in my case, it was at the Canadian Forces Foreign Language School in Vanier in a former school building. And my wife and I, she took leave of absence from her teaching job we had a, a teacher and the two of us in the class. So there was the teacher, his desk in a large room and our desk right in front of his. And there was no looking out the window or falling asleep or uh, scribbling in a notebook. It was your turn, your turn, your turn. And at the end of the year, we were getting ready to go to Moscow and boom, uh, there was a budgetary cut and the assignment was canceled. But uh, we had the opportunity to go to Moscow to be sent uh, later on, just in front of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's visit to Moscow in May 1971, uh, his, the first by a Canadian Prime Minister, uh, with Margaret Trudeau, her first trip abroad. She was pregnant at the time, and it was a 12-day visit, and I was involved in that. And then there was a return visit to Canada by uh, Premier Kosygin in October 71. And he was uh, assaulted on Parliament Hill. A Hungarian Canadian jumped on his back and rode him like a horse, according to a Canadian journalist. And he was met by protests everywhere he went in Canada, uh, in Ottawa, in Montreal, in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Edmonton, by Ukrainian Canadians, Polish Canadians, uh, Canadians from the Baltic states, uh, Hungarian Canadians, and the Jewish community of Canada, who were uh, upset about the lack of uh, Soviet Jews being able to leave the Soviet Union and go to Israel. So he went everywhere in Canada with protests, 100, uh, 1,000, 3,000 people protesting him. 
until he got to um, Vancouver and he was invited to an NHL hockey game. The Department of External Affairs had penned that into his agenda, but he didn't want to go. He didn't want to have another uh, protest by uh, Canadians. And lo and behold, uh, Paul Martin Sr. convinced him to go. He said it would be different. Went out onto the ice. The captain of the Montreal Canadiens was there, uh, Henri Richard, the captain of the Vancouver Canucks. They gave him a hockey stick and he received a huge warm ovation. And for the very first time, the Soviet flag flew in an NHL hockey rink. And for him at that moment, he realized that the way to deal with Canada and Canadians was through hockey. And also during that visit, we signed a general exchanges agreement. And that provided us, the Canadian government with an umbrella to negotiate for the exchange of uh, educators, scientists, people in the cultural uh, areas, as well as sportsmen. And that enabled me dealing with exchanges to begin negotiations with the Soviet Union to have a hockey series with Canada's very best because we had spent 15 years trying to get the Canadian professionals, professionals to play against the Soviet amateurs. They kept winning the Olympic gold, the world championships, and we kept losing. So the fact that there was such a long lead up time uh, created great interest in Canada. And finally, through efforts uh, of our ambassador, Robert Ford, and myself and a couple of other embassy people, and engagement at the highest levels in the Department of External Affairs. The Undersecretary uh, Ed Ritchie at the time had played hockey at Oxford. He had been to Moscow with uh, Pierre Trudeau and he really galvanized the department into supporting this uh, hockey series. And Pierre Trudeau wanted to use it as a form of detente with the Soviet Union because we had gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the threat of nuclear war, he was looking for some common ground. So what this book does is talks about the hockey, because I was involved in almost all the negotiations. I traveled with the Soviet team to the games in Canada in Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. And I looked after Team Canada in Moscow. So. I had access to the players, the coaches, the benches, uh, the dressing rooms and negotiations. And, you know, I was involved in ordering meat and beer and milk, uh, looking after Canadians, 3000 Canadian fans who came to Moscow, uh, unprecedented number, uh, worrying about whether they were going to be put in jail or not. And it, it was, uh, a way to show that diplomacy was very important. I was even negotiating who the referees were gonna be for the last final game. So because I had this bird's eye view, I've told this story. Uh, it let me also tell the story of diplomacy because there had been 40 to 50 books written about this series and almost all of them about the on ice experience. And here I had a, an experience that showed that this series just didn't drop from the sky. There was a lot of diplomatic work involved. So I've told the story as a young diplomat. I also played hockey for the Moscow Maple Leafs. It was an embassy team. Uh, I, I know about hockey, I've played it, uh, but I also was doing it as a diplomat. So I could tell the story as a, someone that had a bird's eye view to the series itself. I could tell the story as a Canadian diplomat using hockey as a medium to get our message across about what do diplomats actually do? What's diplomacy all about? Is it one of the three C's, you know, chandelier, champagne and caviar, or is it down and dirty? And the third reason I wrote this book was to talk about the strategic aspect of it. This was at a time when, uh, China and the Soviet Union were at odds. They were actually fighting on the Usuri River. Richard Nixon, who was no fan of Pierre Trudeau, was making overtures to the Chinese. And the Russians were concerned that 
China and the US were going to gang up against uh, the Soviet Union. So they decided to make an overture toward Canada. And they saw Pierre Trudeau's efforts to develop breathing room from the United States as providing them with an opening. And they also saw Canada as an area of high tech American technology uh, in the uh, auto sector, in the power generation sector, pulp and paper, and so on. So we became uh, a country of interest to the Soviet Union in the high geopolitical uh, realm of the world. So far, this book has uh, attracted an awful lot of attention, and I'm very pleased because, as I've mentioned, I wanted to be able to tell the story to average Canadians of what it is we do as diplomats, what's diplomacy um, all about. Pamela asked me to say a word about this book. Um, it's very hard to get a book published in Canada. Most of our publishing companies have been taken over by American companies and HarperCollins uh, is, is an example. Um, so Canadian publishers, they are interested in five types of uh, material. One is how-to books, you know, how to fix your uh, washing machine, how to uh, do uh, roofing and so on. Uh, a book about celebrities, a book by celebrities, a very strong hard left or hard right book about an air, a subject of current interest. And the fifth area that Canadian publishers are interested in is hockey. So given that fact, uh, when I was lucky enough to be introduced to a um, literary agent, they were able to sell the book uh, two Canadian publishers and three of them bid on it. So I had a very good contract with a uh, Canadian uh, company. And at the same time, because this is the 50th anniversary of the Summit series, two Canadian film companies were going to do a co-production on the Summit series and wanted to do it in a new way. And they decided to option uh, the book so, uh, and exercise that option. So there is a full length documentary film being done. And I was in Moscow uh, shooting in uh, just this past uh, September. Uh, it'll be out in the current September. So we have a book, we have a film, and today also the audio book is being released. But I, my, it's interesting that my editor said to me, look, Gary, do not write this book like you're recording the minutes of a meeting. We don't need to know who's there, every last person who's there. We don't need to know every agenda item. We don't need to have every uh, res, you know, decision that comes out of a meeting. This is a narrative. Make it interesting. Make it a page turner. And that, the, I guess that's the, one of the biggest challenges in writing a book is getting people to look at it first of all, and then getting them into the first chapter and getting them to move on to the second chapter. So you've got to have some, uh, some juice, things of interest. And I found that the book didn't only appeal to people who were interested in hockey or history, diplomacy, but uh, a lot of people were interested in the personal story. You know, how do you get to become a diplomat? Because my father-in-law said to me, you know, Gary, you're never going to become a diplomat. You've got no money and you're from the wrong class. Now, he had grown up in England and he knew about the toffs and what class meant to joining the British Foreign Service. So that personal story of how you get through the entrance exams, how you join the department, what do you do in the department, how do you get ready to go to Moscow during the Cold War, and how do you fend off the KGB? And I have a whole chapter there called Swallows and Ravens about what you were subjected to, all the tricks and of the trade by the KGB of money and bugging and uh, sex and Romeo agents, uh, surveillance, and so on and so forth. And the average reader is interested in that. 
they're interested in the daily life of, of a diplomat and particularly one in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So all this has come together and timing is very important in, in life and in your career and your job. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a nasty, uh, brutal invasion by Putin on the 24th of February, uh, there was concern that that would have a really adverse effect on the book because people were talking about you know, getting rid of books by Tolstoy and not lift, listening to uh, Tchaikovsky anymore. But what's happened is that Russia has become a subject of great interest. You know, what are the Russians thinking? What's driving the Russians? And there has been a large uh, public interest in the book because it's about Russia, because it's timely, and because it's about hockey. Well, thanks. Did you, we, so we have one question. Perry is asking, who started the chant, da da Canada and yet yet Soviet? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know who started it. Uh, they, the fans were uh, full of enthusiasm. But just think about uh, a closed society like Moscow. Uh, it costs about, I think, $650 to go uh, to this series. That's airfare, all hotels, all meals, tickets to all games, uh, tickets to the circus and the Bolshoi and theater. And vodka could be purchased for 99 cents a bottle. So the fans were in a great cup mood. They were wanting to party and they were looking for things to do and, and uh, ways to sing songs. And they sang Oh Canada and so on and so forth. And, then they put together those words, da, da, Canada, niet, niet, Soviet. And that just became a lit motif for the crowd. And then they uh, even started to sing a song to the Soviet national anthem about uh, Phil Esposito. Phil Esposito, Phil Esposito comes from the Sioux. He's from Sioux St. Marie. So there was a lot of excitement, a lot of drinking, a lot of partying going on, and uh, songs just germinated. Thanks. Yeah, I, even I remember that. Um, you know, as a as a little kid, and we, we were chatting before I was explaining that. I, I mean, I'm a bit of an embarrassment as a Canadian diplomat because I'm not really a hockey person at all. And when I was, um, I was, I did two stints in Afghanistan as political advisor to different military commanders. And both times we had hockey people, um, hockey greats come to visit the soldiers. The second time I was better because I had met some of them before, but the first time, you know, I was sitting next to somebody famous and saying, oh, are you a hockey player too? <laughs> Much to the embarrassment of the soldiers around me saying, oh, she just asked, you know, this famous person if, if they were a hockey player. So from my point of view, I mean, the, I, I mean, I'm definitely interested in the whole story, but I really think that for, from Paso's point of view, this is a great opportunity to showcase what diplomats actually do and how, you know, the, career of being in the foreign service can get you into some very, very interesting um, situations, you know, that you would not necessarily expect. Ah, I see someone has a hand up, Jeremy. Jeremy, do you want to be, I can make you a panelist if you want, or you can allow you to talk. There you are. Jeremy is a hockey person and he, um, he was replaced me in uh, Warsaw. So he showed the flag much better in the hockey world there than, than I did uh, when, when I was around. Jeremy, go ahead. I'm asking you to unmute. Okay, sorry for the uh, being slow on the uptake there. Uh, thanks very much, Pam. And uh, yeah, no, well, uh, Gary, and I, I wasn't sure whether it was um, appropriate to ask questions at this point, because I didn't want to interrupt the presentation. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is fascinating. I'm totally going to buy uh, uh, your book. And I, I th maybe Pam was mentioning, we did a bit of uh, hockey diplomacy in Warsaw. I, I owe it really to my uh, trade commissioner uh, colleague, Nicolas Lepage, who's now in Paris. 
but we organized a, a great event. Uh, but I have to say, um, I psyched up my son and myself <clears throat> to play the game against some Polish celebrities. It wasn't exactly the uh, the um, Soviet Red Army of 1972 by watching um, the documentary Cold War on Ice um, and some other things. So I was going to ask you a little bit about you know, how the series has been represented uh, in media and in particular that documentary with, you mentioned Phil Esposito, there's great interviews. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious if there's things that we, um, you know, that we, we, we either haven't been told or that isn't accurate in terms of the narrative uh, that's, that's out there for most people about the, the series. Okay, thanks. Well, there's a lot, um, and if you go through the book, you'll see where I detail things uh, that haven't been told before, like um, after game five in Moscow, uh, the coach, Harry Sinden, uh, the next morning called me over. He said, look, Gary, Phil uh, has been coughing up blood uh, overnight. I need you to take him to a Soviet hospital, uh, have an x-ray, but you're not to tell anybody about it. Uh, not the team members, certainly not the media. And I said, well, what about the team doctor? No, don't tell him either. And uh, by the way, don't tell any Soviets. Well, I was trying to figure out how am I not going to tell any Soviets if I'm going to a Soviet hospital with Esposito. But we had given tickets to the British doctor uh, the night before. So I rang him up. I said, look, here's my problem. Can you help? And he had a contact in an x-ray department at a Soviet hospital. So I bundled uh, Phil into the car and we went over to the, uh, the Soviet hospital and they told him to take his shirt off. And he's a great big guy, Italian background, massive chest. And uh, the uh, technicians, the female technicians were quite excited about it, all giggling. And then we got to the x-ray machine and they had to, extend it this way and extend it this way to make room for Phil's chest. And he finally got up there and doctor looked at it and said, well, no, there's nothing really wrong with you, but I did notice you have this massive um, heart cavity. And he said, that's a great thing for endurance. And Phil was quite excited when I uh, interpreted that for him. He was, he was ready to play, but he had this huge heart. Because Jean Beliveau, conversely, was said to have the, the body of a Cadillac and the heart of a uh, mini minor. <laughs> so at the end, uh, I asked the, I said would, to the Russian doctor and the two uh, assistants, I said, can you keep this quiet? And they said, of course. We saw the game ourselves on television last night. We know what a hero Phil Esposito is. This is just going to remain above us. So nobody ever heard about Phil going to the hospital. So that, that's one story. Um, I guess if, if you look at the telling of this, I mentioned 40 to 50 books and, and various uh, films have been produced about it. It's tended to uh, leave the impression that Alan Eagleson did everything. He organized everything. And people who've read the book so far have said they've been quite surprised at the role that Pierre Trudeau played, Kosygin played, uh, Ambassador Robert Ford played and Ed Ritchie played in external in managing all this because this was a diplomatic effort just as much as a hockey series. And so I think that is all brand new for many, many readers in Canada. And uh, as Pamela was saying, this is a great opportunity for us to show how the work we do really is important uh, and is understood by average Canadians. So when they say, well, what do you guys uh, do for us? This is a very good example. And, you know, hockey, we just had Guy Lafleur's uh, funeral in uh, Quebec. Uh, it's given a state funeral. And uh, I think that that itself shows how important hockey is to the culture and identity of Canadians. Definitely. I mean, oh, I see Perry uh, saying, Oh, people saying thank you, unique opportunity to, uh, and a story that had to be told. So I'm just checking to see if there are questions in, this, in the chat. Um, most Canadians would not see this as an intentional strategy, but it was and is. 
uh, in more than a few countries, a subject for another book, perhaps. Do you have an idea? Are you thinking of writing another book to follow this up? Or I know uh, you've written other things before, I know, on, on different subjects, but. I've written uh, things in the, uh, the two Roma books, uh, Declassified and Mentioned in Dispatches, and a number of academic uh, materials. I was a fellow at Harvard, so I, I've written some things there on Asian security and so on. But, you know, a first posting is like a first love. You tend to remember every detail, uh, less so on subsequent postings. So this, this is such a, a, an important item in Canadian history. Uh, I recalled a lot. Uh, I should mention that I spent a lot of time in the archives in Ottawa, Library and Archives Canada. I had a researcher. All the documents uh, from the embassy and the department are there in the archives and you just have to go through them. And when I went through them, I saw a lot that uh, I had generated myself with, uh, with my signature on them. So uh, I was able to uh, verify what my memory was trying to tell me. And I think that's why this book is different than others too, because it's based on official documents uh, out of Library and Archives Canada. So do I have another story? Um, sure, they, will it have the same resonance? I don't know. The story of what we were doing in Germany when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, what was going on in Indonesia uh, with the Briex gold scandal, which was a massive affair. I mean, people lost billions of dollars in that scandal. And I think one thing that we need to do in uh, global affairs, uh, external foreign affairs, is tell our story. And I don't think we really told the story of how we help evacuations uh, when it's decided that Canadians have to get out of a country. That's a very interesting story in Iran and Lebanon. And I myself in Indonesia, we were given the order to evacuate Canadians and what it takes to. Uh, get in touch with Canadians and tell them they've got one bag and we're going to organize flights and under armed guards and the city's burning and so on. So maybe there's a story there, but it's hard to think that there's a bigger story than the hockey one, but who knows? It's, no, it sounds, but did you find just before I turn over the, the floor to, to Thomas, I just, I just want to abuse the role of the chair for a second and get my own question in. Did you find it hard to switch gears from writing from a diplomatic perspective to writing for, um, you know, a popular audience? I ask because when I left Kandahar, I decided I took a year off and I decided one of my things was I was going to write a memoir. And I did, I did a program at Humber College where you, you, you know, write a book, you have a book at the end of it. But it was hard because I was used to trying to, in my reporting back to Ottawa, trying to make scary things or dangerous things or very interesting things that were a bit ambiguous sound very boring and bureaucratic so as not to get into trouble with my management, you know, that that didn't understand always what was going out going on out, out in the field. Um, and I had a hard time getting letting go of that um, to make it to make things interesting. In the end, I mean, I did sort of, and I realized that I couldn't publish that book without um, without getting fired. So I turned some of it, some of the at atmospheric things into a mystery novel, but it it was definitely, it was hard for me to switch gears. And I'm wondering if you, if you had the same. Yeah, um, I think you have to recall that over time, we used to write dispatches and they could be 10, 20 pages. You could write descriptors of what was going on in flowerly and flowerly language. And our ambassador at the time, Robert Ford, uh, he won a governor general's award for poetry. So you, you could, you took the time, you wrote those things, they were put in the diplomatic bag. Uh, and as time progressed, you had to be more and more concise. You had to get everything down to one or two pages and you had to cut out all the descriptors, get just the facts. And I think that's taken away from our ability to write uh, narratives. Now, there's two ways to go. One is fiction and the other is nonfiction. 
writing fiction, uh, I think, is a lot a lot easier because you can say whatever you want to say and invent whatever characters you want, and you mm -hmm. can use real facts and just bury them in uh, in a general context. Mm -hmm. When you write uh, nonfiction, you've got to have your dates right, and you have to uh, have information right. And I also found that uh, I had to get permission. I had to hire a company in Toronto to get permissions for using quotations from other people. If you're excerpting from another book, you have to get permission. And it's a long, laborious uh, process. So I hired that company. And then to use photographs, uh, there's copyright. And a lot of the photographs going back in time say were taken by the Toronto Star, but they may have been sold to Getty uh, Images. And again, you've got to have people track all this down and you have to pay. You have to pay for the use of every photograph. And in some cases, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars to use a photograph in the book. So that's, that's uh, much more difficult. But I think the important thing is the subject matter. And some people are better writers than other. Others are, but once the further away you are from the department, uh, I think the easier it is for you to write because, <laughs> you know, you've got, you've got more time and you can say more and uh, you can have more pages. So that's, I had an editor uh, who did a really good job at, at cutting and chopping uh, my text. Keep it interesting, Gary. Keep it interesting. I'm going to help you tell your story. Just bear with me. And I said, don't go off on tangents. And as I mentioned, don't make it bureaucratic. <laughs> yes, the kiss of death for sure. Oh, hey, Thomas, sorry, did, I, I wanted to give you the floor there. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Pamela. And uh, especially thank you, Gary, for writing this book. It's uh, really important and it's an interesting one. Uh, my question to you is the inter the handlers that you dealt with did you find that they could ease up at some point they must have been hockey fans too uh did you find them too bureaucratic uh and did they they did they sort of bend at some point did they sort of grab onto this as a as a as a great event as well or did you have to fight all the time to get what you needed you mean the soviet handlers yes well, I mean, the Soviets were caught in a bit of a problem. They had uh, Anatoly Tarasov, the father of Russian hockey. He was desperate to play the Canadians in any way, shape, or form. But the Soviet leadership wanted to make sure that they didn't jeopardize uh, their standing, their amateur standing, uh, because winning gold medals was very important for their propaganda. And the chief Soviet ideologue, uh, Mikhail Suslov, uh, he was in charge of the theory of Soviet man being superior to Western man. And you hear that from Putin today as well, yeah. going on about the decadence of the West and how pure the Russians are and how pure the church is. So they came at this from a different point of view. Um, once the leadership, in the Soviet Union decided they were going to play, that it was in their interest, as long as it could be an exhibition series, uh, home and home, and wouldn't jeopardize their Olympic status. Once that word came down, then uh, they fell in line. And there was a lot of backing and forthing and arguing and so on. But the key thing was the decision was made at the top. And that was always something I could fall back on when uh, things got tough, like in the negotiations over the referees, uh, was that when Alan Eagleson threatened to call the series off if we didn't get our way on the referees, uh, the Soviets were insistent that, that uh, they weren't going to give in. And I was able to refer to the agreement of Brezhnev and Kosygin and Trudeau that this series had to carry on. And Ed Ritchie had, I tell in the, in the, in the book that Ed Ritchie, the undersecretary phones me, I'm second secretary in Moscow. You know, it's like the president of uh, Toronto Dominion Bank calling a teller in a uh, distant area. And uh, Ritchie said, uh, you know, Gary, he, first of all, he said, what the hell's going on over there? But then he said, 
your job is to keep this series on the rails. Keep the series on the rails, no matter what, because it was part of this diplomatic uh, uh, endeavor to engage the Soviet Union and find common ground with them. So I had as much trouble with the Canadians as I did with the Russians. Thank you. Wow. It's, I mean, I guess right now it's hard. I think it's hard for probably some of us to even imagine be, being able to do something like that today, you know, and, but it must have been equally difficult, you know, I, I think maybe, maybe some of us are forgetting what the Cold War really, um, really was like, and, you know, you're bringing that, that back to us a lot. What do you think, I mean, I I, uh, I did an event last week and the and the presenter introduced me to the apparently the latest buzzword for the current condition of the world, which is we're living in a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous, um, which I had never heard before. But apparently, this is the the latest uh, descriptor for our times, and I think it does you know it does make a, a lot of sense. I'm just wondering, I mean, how, do you have any advice for diplomats who are trying to navigate, you know, now with, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult to be a person who is, is advocating today for listening to other people, seeing the other side, making those connections. Um, but I, I recognize it must have been, it must have been uh, equally difficult back then. I mean, do you have any advice for us based on, based on those, those times and what role we can be playing? Well, uh, the CBC uh, interviewed me yesterday and uh, they kept asking me to compare Pierre Elliott Trudeau with Justin Trudeau. And uh, I didn't want to go down that road. But, you know, we had a, I think we had more weight internationally uh, in the 60s and 70s than we do today. Um, part of it is because um, after the Second World War, a lot of countries were down and out. You know, Germany was down and out, Japan down and out. Uh, Europe had been devastated. We played an inordinate role. We had a, a larger military uh, in Europe and elsewhere. We had a lot of troops in Europe. We had fighter aircraft in Europe. Uh, we had a very highly professional diplomatic corps. Ford, for instance, uh, Robert Ford in Moscow, uh, his advice was sought in London, Paris, and Washington. Um, this is a guy who had been there, uh, you know, 20 years. So the, the idea that we have a diplomat abroad who's a poet and has been there in a country 20 years building up knowledge. So I think professionalism is very important, a professional career. Uh, language training, uh, I think, is essential in countries where which are adversaries. So Russia, China, Iran, and so on. Um, and you've got to think about the big picture. Um, maybe we had more uh, because technology was such and we didn't have the PM involved all the time. Uh, there was more rain, that you were given more rain when you were abroad. You certainly were allowed to speak to the local media and press. Uh, when I was ambassador in Indonesia with uh, the collapsing government and BRIEX and so on, I was on TV and radio and in the press all the time in Indonesia. And there was nobody in Ottawa that was controlling what I was saying. They assumed that I was a professional and I knew I had read my guidance that I knew, you know, what to say and what not to say. And so I think that's important that you, if you hire the right people, you train the right people, you've got the right tools when you're abroad, uh, give us, uh, let us have our head and don't control us all from the center. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting when even, um, you know, in, in my career up until my last posting, I, well, I probably was, was wrong about it, but in Afghanistan, I just always assumed that I was entitled to speak on background to journalists the way, you know, we always, we always did. And that has been, has, um, has been scaled back, I understand, an awful lot. And I think it's to the detriment of our understanding you know, of us getting our message out in different parts of the world um, that we are, you know, if you're not allowed to talk to people, they're not going to understand 
where you're you're coming from. Sometimes we even have trouble getting people doing events like this because they feel like they have to get permission from on high at, at global affairs or IRCC, not quite so so much. Um, you know, even to speak to to colleagues. And I don't I don't see how how that's going to work. I mean, it's one of the things that the advantages that we have at PAFSO is that we can go and talk about some things that are that are more difficult for departmental people. Um, There's uh, I just mentioned that there, the, the concept of information exchange, you know, uh, journalists, journalists know a lot about what's going on. Uh, and they'll tell you things that they don't report if you tell them things that uh, you know, on uh, on background, so you exchange information. And I mentioned Alan Gottlieb's uh, idea: of what is a diplomat? You know, one third journalist, one third lawyer, and one third innkeeper. So, <laughs> trading in trading information and being a good journalist uh, is very important. But that means you've got to give in order to get. Mm. We used to say, yeah, in in. Uh, in I heard often people saying that in, in the political section, you were kind of like the, a very good concierge. Um, and, you know, over my career, I, I found that in Sarajevo in particular, dealing with people like in, in industries like that, like in the hospitality industry, I had to set up a meeting once between my boss and someone who normally would have had trouble getting into Sarajevo. And it was the hotel manager of the, the big hotel in town who was able to help me because you know he was dealing with uh, with both sides. So sometimes I you know I hear that kind of thing as a as a pejorative. Um, but I think that those those skills are are super important to being able to get the job done. And it's something that a lot of people don't don't understand because we don't talk about it. You know, we don't That's what a, hospi yeah, a hospitality budget is for uh people will uh, talk over uh, over lunch or dinner and with wine. And I found that you, you can be uh, trying and trying to get into somebody's office and not getting anywhere. But if you invited their spouse to dinner, uh, they would come along. Yeah. Or the great game of golf. You know, a uh, foreign minister you never get to see, but foreign minister is a golfer. So you get four or five hours together uh, with them to talk about this, that, and everything. Yeah. So that's that's why the innkeeping and the concierge stuff is really important. That's where you learn things, find out information. And you know, there's actual neuroscience now that that demonstrates the value of hospitality and you know, sitting down together and having a meal together. I mean, we're primates, you know. I, I remember on my first posting going uh, for a, a weekend going gorilla watching um, on the on the border with Uganda. And one of the things they said is if the gorilla comes up to you and looks threatening, take a leaf from a tree and pretend to eat it and then offer offer some to the gorilla and it will signal that you know you're not there to fight, you're friendly, you, you know, you want them to relax. I mean, there, there's actual science behind the value of these things. And I think we're really, you know, penny wise and pound foolish when when we we cut those kinds of things and don't recognize that. Well, that whole budget thing. So that's why it's so important to get our message out to average Canadians about why diplomats and diplomacy are important to their everyday life and their well-being. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. totally, I totally agree. Um, Gary, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, back in, in The Hague, at the ambassador's residence, there was a tennis court down at the front of the residence. And that was the meeting place during the week, after work, on weekends, where the Soviets would come and play, the Poles would come and play. Uh, that's where the KGB met the CIA folks. Mm -hmm. They had their quiet chats in the corners. And so much was done uh, through that and through the luncheon group that we all had to go to, uh, the Amphictians in The Hague, where we all got together for lunch once a, a month. And that was part of your hospitality. And you had to be there because you were meeting all of the folks that you were dealing with or not dealing with. I was involved in the refugee immigration out of The Hague at the time. And we were taking Polish refugees uh, out 
and you had to deal with the KGB guy sitting across the table from you who was trying to figure out what you were doing. And uh, it was quite interesting work. And, and I'll disagree a little bit, Gary, with you on one point. I think people, the, the diplomats today are still living in their history. And 20 years from now, as it did for you and 30 years on, 40 years on, they will pinpoint points of their, uh, their postings, which have been amazing opportunities, whether it's the refugee work or it's the evacuation work or whether it's a trade work uh, they've all, all of you uh, have that, those experiences which are worth recording. The immigration side, I think, does a bit better job of putting that out through the historical society and the history books coming out of the, uh, ref the Vietnamese refugee program. I was involved in that in Asia. But then a very good job of using that to highlight the strategic importance of immigration and, and the work of the immigration officers abroad. And that's changed too as well, as you've mentioned in, in diplomacy, uh, interviewing doesn't happen much anymore. It's all done by electronics and, and technology. Uh, but those stories are still out there and the stories of young diplomats today will be the stories of books 30 and 40 years later, at least I hope so. Yeah, the, um, what's the book uh, that Mike Malloy helped uh, write? Yeah, yeah the, the refugee program, the, the, uh, the Vietnamese program. Mike Malloy, yeah. Rob Schalke, and all my ex-colleagues uh, wrote that book. And there's more, more to come. And every month or every two months, we get a, a, a newsletter which highlights the stories that people put down. I'm not sure whether they get approval to put all of that stuff down because they, they really highlight their personal experiences. I'm an ex-naval officer as well. And the, the naval officers also have done a very, very good job of highlighting their their particular anecdotes called salty dips, and they put those out in books. And those are really, really important stories uh, of the Royal Canadian Navy from the 45 onwards even to today. Uh, so that how do you get that out to the, the, the common person, if you will, the, the citizens of Canada need to know this and the important job that you do. That hockey diplomacy, they have no idea that there's a strategy involved. They just see a hockey game or or, you know, hockey players going off to Afghanistan. That is hugely important, one for morale, but also for involving other, other cultures and other people. China was an example of that. We went, to, we went to Beijing, I was in Hong Kong at the time, and we'd go to, Hong Kong, uh, to Beijing and play hockey and Korea. And uh, officials came out to those games. I mean, in these countries where hockey wasn't so popular, but it is now. Yeah, well, you're, you're absolutely right. So the, the question is, how do we get this message through to the Canadian population and through to uh, the academic community, through to the media? And I think we need to get out of the Ottawa bubble and uh, go around. I once suggested to an undersecretary that um, we hire a couple of two, three, four RVs for the summer. So when people came back on leave from a posting, uh, there'd be an yeah. RV for them. Uh, in exchange for driving around the country and stopping and going into libraries and giving little speeches about uh, their country of accreditation. Mm. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that has to be done. Uh, getting into uh, the rural areas of Canada. Uh, one of the things I liked most recently was uh, a journalist in Saskatchewan said to me, uh, he had read everything there was to read about the Canada Soviet hockey series. Uh, and when he saw my book come out and he saw the word diplomat on it, he said, oh man, this is gonna be as dry as dust. Uh, it's gonna be boring history. But once he started reading it in his kitchen, he devoured it and he kept yelling out to his wife, you've gotta read this, you've gotta hear this, this is great. So it's, um, it's telling the story in a way that's of interest uh, and resonates across the country. So we need to continue to do uh, our job in, in remembering that it's not just people in Ottawa that need to know, it's every Canadian needs to know what this profession's all about. Thank you. No, that's, uh, I think that's, that sounds like that, that might be a good, uh, a good note to end on. Um, was we're getting to, to 9.58. Alexandra, I just wanted to give you the chance. Did you want to say anything before we, before we sign off? I can um, ask. 
sorry. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. This was a super interesting chat this morning. I actually just ordered the book as you were talking because I can't wait to to read more on it. But uh, but thank you very much. And, and this is a great event. Yeah. Well, thank Alexandra, you. thank you. Um, the book, the book. There's going to be a book signing in Ottawa next Monday night, uh, the 16th, 6:30 p.m. till 8 at Perfect Books on uh, Elgin Street. So, uh, if you come along to that, I can uh, write you uh, a, a note in the book uh, oh, and would, sign it for you. That would be really lovely. But I'm actually speaking of small towns. I'm in a tiny rural community right now. But <laughs> but I'll I'll keep an eye out if you have any other book signings, and that would be really great. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. And thank you to, to Thomas and, and Alexandra and the other folks, Jeremy. Jeremy just uh, had to jump off to another meeting. But before we go, I wanted to make a plug for uh, he is going to do our next uh, Paso breakfast, which is usually on the, the second Tuesday of the month. And he's going to be talking to us in his capacity as a, a GAC's official languages champion. So that should be a, an interesting, uh, an interesting discussion. And, uh, and I hope that people will come out to that. Gary, do you, can I give you the last word? Do you want to give us any advice before we, before we go? Uh, it's a great career and love it and speak about it and make sure that you act as a transmission belt to those who make decisions on money and, uh, and staffing in, in foreign affairs because I think it's important we have a professional uh, group of diplomats. I think that's the best way to serve this country's interests uh, abroad. And as we know, what's going on abroad uh, impacts what happens here at home. Definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, so on that note, I think we'll say goodbye. And we are at exactly 10.01. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. And goodbye. And I hope to see you uh, back at uh, some of our, our other events that will come up during the year. Hey, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.